Thank you, Deidre. On behalf of the Hingham Historical Society Education Committee, welcome to all of you, especially those in our live via Zoom audience. This is our fifth program in the Benjamin Lincoln World Series. Today's program is titled Education in Colonial New England, Schooling in a Changing World. It is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Andy Hertig. As some of you know, Andy, who retired in 2013, had a decades long career at Phillips Exeter Academy, where he served as Dean of Faculty and Chair of the History Department. Andy earned his undergraduate degree from Harvard University, a school whose beginnings we will hear about during today's talk. Andy also received a master's degree in US history from UC Berkeley. A resident of Hingham since his retirement, Andy, with his wife, Jane Carr, who many of you know, lives in what our current series describes as Benjamin Lincoln's neighborhood. Andy currently serves as a member of the Hingham Historical Society's Education Committee. We can't thank Jane and Andy enough for their multifaceted engagement with the mission of the Hingham Historical Society. Andy will speak for approximately 50 minutes. Following his prepared remarks, I will moderate a Q&A based on audience questions, which we invite you to enter in the Q&A box at any time during the program. And you should find that at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And now I give you Andy Herte. Thank you, Eileen, for that generous introduction. And thank you for all the help that you've provided in preparing this lecture. Uh, for the audience, the audience should know that um, Eileen is responsible for all the slides associated with the lecture. And she also discovered the two diaries that uh, play a part in, in, the, in the presentation. Last spring, when I first agreed to give this lecture, I, like most of us, had no idea where we would be in January, and more specifically, no idea that the combination of the pandemic and the hyper-partisanship of the political campaign would raise fundamental questions about the way we educate our students and the effect of education on our society. And many of us have asked why our education system hasn't done a better job of passing on the values that define us as Americans or better prepared our youth for the jobs of the 21st century. These questions seemed relevant to me in considering the educational situation in colonial New England. How well did our forebears succeed in addressing the problems they faced and at the same time, create a foundation for the leadership New England plays to this day in the educational life of the country? Is any of their experience relevant for today? Of course, the circumstances in 17th century and 18th century New England were quite different from today. The colonists of Massachusetts Bay were trying to reproduce an English system of education in what to them was a wilderness. <clears throat> in addition, they saw themselves in a covenant with, with God to establish a model community that would serve as an example for purifying the Anglican church at home. As John Winthrop, the first governor of the colony, put it in a sermon delivered to his followers in 1630 as they, were, as, as they left England on the Arbella, quote, for we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us, so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken, and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword through the world. When we think of the early colonization of Massachusetts, we naturally emphasize the importance of the Pilgrim landing at Plymouth in 1620. After all, they established the first European settlement in the area and are featured, uh, the featured subjects of our major national hol holiday. But in fact, the Massachusetts Bay Colony played a much more important role than the Pilgrims in shaping the history of the region. The core of the hundred or so Mayflower passengers were members of a small radical religious group 
that had illegally separated from the Anglican Church in 1607, hence the label separatist. They had first moved to Holland, where a more liberal legal climate allowed them to practice their, their religion as they saw fit. When they soon realized, though, that their children's adjustment to life in Holland threatened their English identity and the strength of their faith, they resolved to emigrate to the New World, where they would be able to establish an independent community in accordance with their religious beliefs and English customs. In contrast, the Puritans who founded Massachusetts Bay were, were non-separatists who saw their endeavor as part of a widespread movement to reform the Anglican Church. In this situation, they enjoyed much broader support in England than the Pilgrims. And as repressive measures at home increased under Charles I, a group of influ influential Puritans concentrated primarily in East Anglia, organized a joint co stock company in 1629 to establish a colony in Massachusetts for which they received a royal charter that became the basis of the Bay Colony government. Unlike most earlier immigrants to the New World, the Puritans came in family groups, often led by their local pastor and organized to include all the social classes essential to a functioning community ranging from farmers and artisans to university educated leaders. They also brought significant financial resources from the sale of their property in England. And they came in large numbers. By 1641, approximately 17 or 18,000 English immigrants had arrived in New England, 12,000 of whom settled in, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony from 1630 to 1641 in what became known as the Great Migration. But for us, the important point is that, is that these people were devoted to education. Virtually all the English immigrants to North America valued education because they feared that without it, their children would sink into barbarism growing up in a wilderness. But for the Massachusetts Bay colonists, literacy as the key to understanding the scriptures was particularly important. In mid 15th century Europe, Johannes Gutenberg's introduction of printing with movable type had made relatively inexpensive books widely available. A revolution in information technology, perhaps as important as the internet today. Prior to Gutenberg, books were of course, hand copied letter by letter. A skilled scribe could perhaps produce about two pages in a six hour day. At this rate, a large book might require a year to complete. In contrast, the same task would require just two weeks for two printers turning out 1,250 sheets daily. The demand for Bibles in the language of ordinary people proved especially strong. The Protestant Reformation beginning in the 16th century provided major incentive for promoting literacy. Protestant theology emphasized the importance of direct access to the scriptures as a key element in the path to salvation. And Gutenberg's innovation made printed versions of religious literature readily available. As a result, all Protestant families had an obligation to teach their children to read. This was particularly true in Massachusetts Bay which as we have seen from Winthrop's sermon considered itself in a covenant with God to create a community modeled on the early Christian church. To the extent the Bible provided guidance as to how to establish such a community, interpretation of scripture became an essential factor in the success of the enterprise. As the preamble to a 1647 Massachusetts literacy, literacy law put it, that old deluder Satan wants to keep men from the knowledge of the scriptures by keeping them in unknown tongues. Geography too played an important role in promoting education in New England. Compared to the Southern colonies where inhabitants were scattered in widely spaced plantations, New Englanders settled in compact towns which facilitated access to local schooling. <clears throat> 
Ingham provides a clear example. Traditionally, the founding of the town dates to September 1635, when in, when in accordance with an order from the colonial government, 37 house lots were drawn, forming a cluster of homes along what is now North and Lincoln Streets. This pattern followed the English model of a farming village, according to which residents lived in a central location and were assigned fields, woodlots, and marshland outside the village to carry on their farming. Initially, schooling in Hingham occurred in private homes or rented spaces. The first well-documented construction of a school building in Hingham did not incur, occur until 1668. And predictably, it was located in the center of Hingham across the street from what is now Old Derby within easy walking distance of the original house lots on North Street. Education in Massachusetts also benefited from strong central authority <laughs> emanating from both the colonial government and the clergy. Fear of God's punishment should the community fail to uphold its side of the covenant provided a strong incentive for adhering to Puritan orthodoxy. To circumvent Satan's wiles, the 1647 law required any town with at least 50 households to hire a schoolmaster to teach reading and writing. Larger towns, those with at least 100 households, were to maintain a Latin grammar school that would prepare students for university study. An earlier law in 1642 required town selectmen to ensure that parents and the masters of apprentices provided sufficient instruction for those in their care to be able to read and understand the principles of religion and the laws of the community. It's perhaps not surprising then that only five years after the founding of Boston, a meeting of townspeople under the influence of the Reverend John Cotton voted to establish a school modeled after the, after the Free Grammar School of Boston, England. Thus began the Boston Latin School. It focused on a curriculum of classical literature requiring a thorough knowledge of Greek and Latin. Its ostensible purpose was to prepare promising boys for university admission with the goal of ensuring a well-trained clergy. But it edu educated political leaders as well. Five signers of the Declaration of Independence had attended Boston Latin, among them John Hancock, Samuel Adams, and Benjamin Franklin. That Boston could consider establishment of what in effect was a college preparatory school when the only opportunities for higher education were in England illustrates the Massachusetts Bay Colony's commitment to education. But even more impressive was the founding of Harvard College only a year after the establishment of Boston Latin. On October 28, 1636, the general court voted to allocate 400 pounds for the creation of a school or college to be located in Cambridge. For such a small community, this amount constituted a huge sum, almost a quarter of the colony's entire tax levy for that year. Fortunately, John Harvard, a recent arrival in the colony with a university education added to this amount by bequeathing his library and half his estate, approximately 800 pounds to the fledging enterprise. A Puritan account of Massachusetts early years entitled New England's First Fruits clearly describes in a long passage, the religious motivation that inspired such sacrifice. After God had carried us safe to New England and we had builded our houses, provided necessaries for our livelihood, reared con convenient place for God's worship and settled a civil government. One of the next things we longed for and looked after was to advance learning and perpetuate it to posterity. Dre dreading to leave an illiter illiterate ministry when our present ministers shall lie in the dust. Admittedly, Harvard in its earliest years bore little resemblance to a university. Students were generally teenagers, always male, 
and their behavior frequently aroused the ire of the local magistrates. The first class numbered only 10 students and the first head of the college was fired in 1640 for almost beating to death his assistant with whom he had disagreed. By 1650 though, under the more effective leadership of Henry Dunster, the college had approximately 40 undergraduates and 10 graduate students. Between 1673 and 1707, 360 young men had star studied at Harvard, virtually all of them from New England. Harvard was well launched, fully carrying out its mission of providing educated leaders for the region. Not until the 18th century did other co colonies provide a comparable level of higher education. Meanwhile, other New England towns following Boston's example and the requirements of the Mas Massachusetts General Court established schools in Charlestown, Dorchester, Salem, Lynn, and Hingham too. All New, all New England except Rhode Island had 12 grammar schools and a wide variety of less demanding educational opportunities. So-called writing schools taught penmanship, reading, and arithmetic. Evening schools offered classes so that ambitious apprentices could study practical subjects such as navigation, surveying, or accounting. In more sophisticated locales like Boston in the 18th century, upper class youth could even learn to dance. As mentioned a few moments ago, the first definite school records of the schoolhouse in Ham appear in 1668. But there is some evidence that an earlier building existed at the same location as early as 1661. Although an additional school was constructed in 1721 on the plain, which an area near what is now Hingham Center, it was in session for only a portion of the year. And until 1752, Hingham had only one full-time school. A long list of teachers hired after 1668 to teach in Hingham suggests that beginning in 1670, the original school was a grammar school since Latin and Greek were a part of the curriculum. Clearly though, other forms of instruction must have been going on since virtually all children apparently learned to read and write, at least at an elementary level. Who taught them? The English model that the colonists brought with them seems to have been part of the answer. English villages were organized around patriarchal families that, it, that included not only a wife and children, but also anyone else who might have been living in the household, collateral relatives, servants, and workers or apprentices. The head of the household was responsible for ensuring a minimum level of education to include morals, some literacy, and the acquisition of a useful occupational skill. So homeschooling was an important part of the educational mix in colonial Massachusetts. As is true today, women played the leading role in education at home. In addition to teaching their own children to read, they often extended their services to friends and neighbors, forming what came to be known as dame schools, initially in their own homes, and if the demand existed, expanding into rented space. These schools were co-educational co and often the only formal instruction for girls. In Hingham, no mention of girls' schools appears in the public records until 1767, when provision was made for instruction in reading, writing, and sewing. There's actually no evidence that that school was actually ever built. That virtually all women in Massachusetts were literate in spite of their limited opportunities for, for formal education illustrates the importance of homeschooling and the role mothers played in colonial education. Abigail Adams provides a useful example from the mid century, of, uh, from the mid 18th century of what this system might produce. Clearly she's an exception in her intelligence and the opportunities her family situation provided. Yet parts of her experience were probably typical. Her mother taught her to read and also ensured that she mastered all the basic skills expected of a colonial housewife in an agrarian economy. 
When she married John in 1664 and moved to his family farm, she did all her own cooking and performed the usual chores of a farm wife, churning butter, tending ducks and chickens, and making clothes for the family from cloth she had spun and woven herself. All this from a woman whose family had considered her too frail as a child to attend school, an apparent disadvantage that proved fortuitous in the long run. Her father, as a well-educated clergyman, had an extensive library, which he encouraged his daughter to explore. And her interest in reading blossomed when her older sister's fiance, Richard Cranch, introduced her to a wide variety of English and French literature. Coincidentally, Cranch, a close friend of John Adams, also introduced Abigail to her future husband. The importance of sewing in the education of women of all classes is apparent in the diary of Anna Green Winslow, a 12-year-old girl whose parents sent her from Nova Scotia to Boston in 1771 for, quote, finishing. She evidently came from a well-to-do family, in one instance having spent 45 pounds, the equivalent of a teacher's annual salary, on a cloak and bonnet. Yet she attended a sewing school, not only to learn fancy needlework, but also to spin her own yarn and make utilitarian items like a shirt for her uncle or underwear for herself. And for the most part though, community education focused on boys. Towns contracted with teaching candidates to instruct at various levels for an agreed upon compensation. But these were not free public schools in the sense we understand the term. Usually the parents who could afford to paid for the children's instruction at the rate agreed upon in the town's negotiation with, with the teacher. And tax money was used only to pay for students too poor to afford the designated fees. Other than reading, penmanship and ciphering, the male occupational skills in an agrarian economy could best be learned at home on the farm. In this manner, the Massachusetts community ensured a certain minimum level of ed education for all its children. But as is true today, the results varied considerably depending on the circumstances of the family and the ability of the student. Again, the Adams family provides a useful example. John learned to read and received his first formal education in a co-educational dame school. He then went on to the local common school, but found it uninspiring. Evidently, Mr. Cleverly was not a very good teacher. He wanted only to follow his father's footsteps as a prosperous farmer and pillar of the community, where his father envisioned for him a Harvard education and a career in the ministry. When he learned of John's dislike for his school, he promptly enrolled him in a private academy taught by a Harvard graduate who succeeded in stimulating John's interest in learning. From there, he went on to Harvard, graduating in the class of 1755. Education in Massachusetts was widely available, but not equal. In addition to the family and the government, the church also played an important role in educating the youth of the colony. Not only did children attend with their parents two lengthy services on Sunday, but they also were required to memorize and be tested on important items, such as the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and a catechism of questions and answers covering the basic tenets of their faith. The connection between religion and education is perhaps most clearly illustrated in the New England Primer. With approximately 2 million copies sold in the 18th century, it became the basic textbook for teaching children to read. And since for Puritans, the purpose of reading was to promote piety through universal access to the Bible, it's not surprising that virtually all the teaching material had a strong religious theme, beginning with the alphabet as the accompanying slide illustrates. A, in Adam's fall, we sinned all. B, heaven defined the Bible mind. 
See, Christ crucified for sinners died. The deluge drowned the earth around and so on. As you can see, virtually every letter is connected to a biblical story or a religious maxim. The text also provided simple prayers. One of the most familiar goes like this. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to take. My own grandmother introduced this prayer into the family children's bedtime routine, but thought the message so negative, she changed the words to depict a less frightening night. Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. And when I wake in the morning light, God will keep me through the night. Since for Puritans, salvation was the ultimate goal in life, perhaps the original wording had a more reassuring connotation for Puritan children than for more modern youngsters. Keep in mind that rote learning defined the prevailing teaching method in colonial elementary education. So students would have been expected to have memorized the material in the primer. For the alphabet, the task was appropriate and relatively easy. With a catechism written by the noted cleric John Cotton, memorization of the hundred or so questions and their answers was far more difficult as this small sample should demonstrate. Um, question 94, what is baptism? Baptism is a sacrament wherein the, wa the washing of water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost does signify and seal our engrafting into Christ and partaking of the benefits of the covenant of grace and our engagement to be the Lord's. As an aid to memorization, children depended on a so-called horn book, a wooden tablet on which the material to be learned was either copied or attached, and then protected with a thin transparent film of horn or coat of shellac. The accompanying picture illustrates a typical example. As you can see, the horn book also served as an aid to reading instruction since it provided a guide to pronouncing, pronouncing combinations of letters. And in the case of the Lord's Prayer, a text the student had already heard many times. You can see at the top is the alphabet and then the phonics lesson, uh, and then the Lord's Prayer at the bottom. In any case, children took their religious training seriously. Even though Anna Winslow, the young Boston diarist of the early 1770s, devoted much of her journal to social life and fashion. She also documented a daily reading of her Bible and dutifully attempted summaries of sermons and religious lectures she had attended. Remember, this girl is only 12 years old. Like so many reform movements, the Puritan experiment in Massachusetts did not turn out as its founders had expected. Yet the values that defined the society and held it together prevailed. The importance of education so strongly reflected in the system of the Puritans constructed successfully convey, conveyed to succeeding generations a sense of common purpose and a demanding moral code. For most of our history, we have indeed seen ourselves as a city upon a hill, although at the moment, American exceptionalism seems to be under siege. In many ways, however, the Puritans faced far more challenging problems in the last six day, decades of the 17th century than anything we are experiencing today. In the English civil wars that raged intermittently from 1642 to 1660, the Puritans, who sided with Parliament against the King and eventually formed a com commonwealth under Oliver Cromwell, did not look to New England for inspiration. Massachusetts became irrelevant as a model for English Puritans. Immigration to the colony dropped sharply. In addition, when the Stuart line of Kings was restored in 1660, Massachusetts in 1684 under Charles II lost its charter and the self-government it guaranteed. Gone in one blow were their legislative assemblies, their elected governors, and the right to manage their own town meetings. <clears throat> 
when James II, Charles II's son, was overthrown in the so-called Glorious Revolution of 1688, Massachusetts won a new charter in 1691 with many of its original rights restored, but it became a royal colony with an appointed governor and an early version of religious toleration that allowed the unreformed Anglican church a foothold in, a, in what had once been an exclusive Puritan enclave. In, a, in addition, property qualifications now defined the right to vote rather than church membership. At home in Massachusetts, troubles loomed as well with the faithful. The religious fervor of the original settlers waned somewhat in the next generation. No longer could a personal conversion experience be required for church membership. And uniformity of belief proved difficult to maintain as dissenters could always move to nearby locations such as Rhode Island or New Hampshire. And then from 1675, to 1678, war with the region's indigenous people raids through much of New England. The Wamp Wampanoag chief Metacom, the son of Massasoit and known as King Philip to the colonists, reversed his father's policy of befriending the English settlers. He had concluded that the steady encroachment of the colonists would soon deprive the Wampanoags of all their land. War seemed like the only remedy. The result was a calamity for all involved. The Wampanoags and their allies lost all their land and hundreds, including Metacom, were killed. The colonists suffered grievous losses as well. 12 towns destroyed in the space of a year, the economies of Plymouth and Rhode Island destroyed, and one-tenth of the military eligible men killed. The non-combatant casualties on both sides measured as a percent of the total population, exceeded the toll in both the American Revolution and the Civil War. In the face of these traumatic events, it is no wonder that some in the, in the community came to believe that God had withdrawn his favor and that an outbreak of witchcraft in Salem showed Satan at work. Widespread literacy in New England had not, only had not only produced almost universal access to religious works, but also offered entertaining accounts of seemingly miraculous events, often seen as a sign of divine intervention, but on other occasions attributed to a nefarious conspiracy of the devil. In such an environment, the overwrought accusations of some impressionable adolescent Salem girls triggered an exaggerated official response that resulted in the trial and execution of 20 innocent adults, mostly women. Faced with the enormity of this judicial murder, common members of the clergy denounced the use of spectral evidence in court proceedings and the hysteria passed. At about the same time, as these events, the work of Isaac Newton and John Locke marked a radical change in how intellectuals conceived of humans' relationship to God, nature, and one another. Newton's Principia Mathematica, published in 1687, developed mathematical formulas defining the motion of heavenly bodies, thereby making God and his universe more accessible to human understanding through the application of God-given reason. In a similar manner, Locke in a series of essays uh, appearing from 1689 to 1692, depicted politics and education as processes best ordered by the light of reason informed by experience and experiment. This way of thinking permeated higher education. And by the time John Adams graduated from Harvard in 1755, the college had gone beyond its original goal of training ministers. Mathematics and science particularly sparked Adam's interest, but he read widely in a variety of subjects, eventually gravitating toward politics and the law. In a graduation ceremony debate, he argued for the affirmative on the question, is civil government absolutely necessary for men? A theme he would pursue for much of his life. Lest we think that Puritan principles no longer obtained, 
the daily requirement put forth in the college regulations of morning prayer at six and evening prayer at five shows that religion was still important. And the authorities paid close attention as well to personal conduct. Quote, all scholars were to behave themselves blamelessly, leading sober, righteous, and godly lives, leaning at prayers, lying, blasphemy, fornication, drunkenness, or picking of locks were also forbidden. Keep in mind that the first edition of the New England Primer appeared at the same time as the writings of Newton and Locke, and not only did it reinforce religious belief in young students, but it also emphasized general rules of good behavior, as, as this picture illustrates with this excerpt, a lesson for children. Pray to God, call no ill names, love God, use no ill words, fear God, tell no lies, serve God, hate lies, take not God's name in vain, speak the truth, spend your time well, do not swear, love your school, do not steal, mind your book, cheat not in your play, strive to learn, play not with bad boys, be not a dunce. Benjamin Lincoln's career clearly demonstrates how his Puritan background combined with the rationalism of the 18th century and the support of his community created the qualifications for a strong leader, even though Lincoln had only a common school education. As the author David Mattern so succinctly stated in the opening sentence of his Lincoln biography, of the many influences that shaped the life and character of Benjamin Lincoln, none proved so profound as the, time, as the trinity of town, church, and family. As we've noted earlier, these are the same elements that defined education in Puritan New England. As the descendant of one of Hingham's founding families and the son of a prosperous and popular community leader, Lincoln had the advantage of a large and supportive network of family friends and town officials. His, apparent, his parents especially played a key role in shaping his approach to life, inculcating in him the Puritan values of hard work, self-discipline, and faith in God. They also taught him the importance of service and leadership in community affairs, a path he followed throughout his life. The church, too, as represented by Ebenezer Gay, the renowned pastor of Hingham's first parish, strongly influenced Lincoln's development. As Mattern describes Gay's impact, he notes that the pastor, quote, believed that man was a rational being, being in whom God implanted in an inner moral sense, and thus, if properly guided, man's reason would naturally choose good over evil a few points seriously in question today. Education then for most colonial New Englanders involved much more than what one, what one learned in the classroom. And even though Lincoln's had relatively little schooling and had to acquire the skill of a polished, polished writing and speaking on his own, he was well prepared in qualities of character for the leading role he played in colonial affairs. The security of his faith the guidance of his parents and the bonds that united his community instilled in him the confidence and calm to successfully cope with the many, many challenges he was to face in his career. Even so, he keenly regretted the lack of a classical education, which so many of his high status colleagues in later life enjoyed. And he ensured that his sons, Benjamin Jr. and Theodore went to Harvard. He also urged them to acquire the social skills, think dancing school, and etiquette of upper class life, the lack of which he strongly felt as he began to move in those circles. Again, education may have been, developed, have been widespread in New England, but like today, the opportunities it offers depended significantly on wealth and social status, which to some extent Lincoln also enjoyed. Although well-grounded in qualities of character, he also benefited from a childhood in an influential, well-to-do family, and he was able to pass on to his sons the advantages of a university education. 
The same pattern appears in another prominent Hingham family, the Thaxters, but with a different result. Like the Lincolns, they were among the original settlers and through the acquisition of land, John Thaxter, the head of the family at the time of the revolution, had arrived in the top 1% of the 400 families of Hingham. Surrounding his house on the corner of South Street, in the, the current community center, he cultivated a garden and an orchard, and in total owned approximately 150 acres in Hingham, the most valuable of which was 62 acres on World's End. He was also one of the leader, leaders in town affairs. What is of interest to us though, is the diary his 12 year old son Quincy kept from 1774 to 1778, in which he documented the division of his time between school and work on the family farm. Like many youngsters, including Benjamin Lincoln, he was expected to share in the work. Poorer families out of economic necessity required the labor of all family members. But in Quincy's case, the purpose seems to have been for him to learn the skills necessary for running a farm. As a result, his schooling reflected the, the demands of the agricultural calendar. Regular attendance in the winter from November through February and many absences during seasons of planting, cultivating and harvesting. Although he generally attended school 11 months annually, 132 days in his best year, for only seven weeks of this time did he spend five consecutive days in the classroom. Quincy wrote nothing in his diary about his experience at school, so it's difficult to determine the reason for his sporadic attendance. Did his father think his work at home was more important? Did the pedagogy of copying, memorizing, and reciting mean that, the, that only recitation days mattered? Or was it just that Quincy was an indifferent student? We don't know. What we do know is that his father valued, valued higher education. He himself had graduated from Harvard and he provided a Harvard education for Quincy's older brother, John Jr., who went on to be John Adams' secretary during Adams' European diplomatic mission to end the Revolutionary War. It appears that Quincy's father had decided early on that of his two sons, John Jr. had the better chance of a distinguished career and that Quincy should stay in Hingham to manage the farm, which he did, marrying at age 24 and living in the house on South Street for the rest of his life with his wife, six children and three sisters. For that, his common school education was perfectly adequate. From our point of view, one might wonder why primary education played such an emphasis on penmanship. But remember that until the typewriter came into common use in the 1880s, all written communication was by hand. Legibility was therefore critical. As you can see, Quincy's penmanship improved considerably during the four years he kept uh, his diary. In the case of Benjamin Lincoln, his formal education could lead to a career far beyond the confines of Hingham. And Lincoln's exceptional personal qualities clearly account for his success. In contrast, Quincy's experience was more typical of what formal schooling was expected to achieve. By the end of the 18th century though, the importance of a uni university education had become more significant. Hingham by this time had a number of private academies that prepared students in the classics. And Benjamin Lincoln in the late 1790s encouraged his friends from other colonies to send their boys to prepare for Harvard at these schools under his watchful care. A dozen of his friends accepted his suggestion, but it is clear that Lincoln's character was as important an attraction as the quality of the schooling. As one of his friends wrote, the improvement of my children's minds I conceive a serious object, but the purity of their hearts and the practice of morality is the primary one. Here then I feel rejoiced when I consider that my son will often see you and he will know you and will benefit from your example. Among the, the Hingham private schools offering a college preparatory program was the recently established Derby Academy which opened its doors in April, 1791, and by 1795 had achieved such a favorable reputation 
to George Washington, recommended it to his nephew as one of two college preparatory schools in Massachusetts suitable for his nephew's sons. I'm sorry to report as a um, former Exeter teacher that the uh, other school in Massachusetts was Andover, which is where in fact his nephew sent the sons. Since 1670, when Hingham reached the 100 family threshold requiring the establishment of a grammar school, its tax supported common school had maintained a college preparatory program that sent a number of students to Harvard. And as late as 1714, five of the 11 Harvard graduates that year came from Hingham. But from this point on, taxpayer willingness to support the cost of an education that few of them could use steadily declined. The revolution had seriously damaged Ingham's economy. In 1779, the town grammar school closed. At this point, Madame Derby came to the rescue. Many of you are familiar with her story and from her upbringing, she seems the most un unlikely candidate for educational innovation. Born Sarah Langley in 1714, the daughter of a tavern keeper, she apparently had no formal schooling yet in fun, some fashion learned to write, to read, write, and keep accounts. Her marriage in 1778, 1738, excuse me, to Ezekiel Hersey, one of the largest landholders in Hingham and a noted physician catapulted her in Cinderella-like fashion into the ranks of the upper class. Hersey was more interested in medicine than managing his property. And Sarah, who had somehow acquired financial acumen and administrative skills took over the supervision of her husband's estate, apparently with his enthusiastic approval. Upon his death in 1761, he bequeathed all, all of his estate to Sarah with only the stipulation that should he predecease her, she contribute a thousand pounds of her inheritance to Harvard College for the, for quote, the support of a professor of anatomy and physic, end quote, which she did and which marked the beginning of Harvard Medical School. In the meantime, 10 months after Ezekiel Hersey's death, Sarah had remarried. Her new husband was Richard Derby, a wealthy Salem merchant and ship owner, recently widowed, whom Sarah had met through Ezekiel's close friendship with a Harvard classmate living in Salem. The two families had frequently enjoyed social occasions in either Salem or Hingham. By the time of Ezekiel's death, Sarah was well known in Salem society. In a prenuptial agreement, Sarah and her, and her husband-to-be agreed to keep their assets separate, an unusual arrangement at a time when a wife's property automatically fell under the control of her husband. Apparently, the couple lived amicably, though, when Richard died in 1783, he generously bequeathed to her some material possessions and a small annuity for as long as she remained a widow. But the bulk of his fortune went to his children. As a result, when Sarah returned to Hingham after her husband had died, the money she contributed to the founding of Derby was her own. Initially, she had assumed she would give her fortune to Harvard and she did add funds to supplement the donation Ezekiel stipulated in his will. But she was willing to consider other possibilities some, should some pressing need arise. And two influential Hing Hingham leaders, the pastors Ebenezer Gay of the first parish and Daniel Shute of the second parish, both Harvard graduates, convinced her that such a deed, the need indeed existed in the form of a privately funded college for territory academy. Sarah had been one of Gay's parishioners for all her years in Hingham, and she deeply respected his judgment. Shoot, a close friend of Gay's, added weight to Gay's appeal. For Madame Derby, a bright woman whose gender and social class had deprived her of any formal education, the opportunity to create a co-educational school open to able students of all classes must have had considerable appeal. By the mid 1700s, the William Penn Charter School founded by Philadelphia Quakers in 1697 had set a high standard offering a comprehensive curriculum to 400 students on four le levels, ranging from primary schooling 
to various forms of occupational training and college preparation. Open to males and females, rich and poor, it provided, provided a model of what was possible. So in 1784, Madame Derby, following the guidance of Ebenezer Gay and Daniel Shute, set out to create such a school, albeit without the primary division, which it was thought Hingham adequately provided. Shute took the lead in the first major step, the appointment of trustees acceptable to Madame Derby. Shute himself and Ebenezer Gay topped the list and the remainder formed a network drawn from interrelated leading families in the region. John Thaxter and his first cousin, Benjamin Lincoln, were the next choices, followed by William Cushing, the Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Court, and the first cousin of the Cushing sisters, the wives of Daniel Shute and Benjamin Lincoln. And Nathan Cushing, also a cousin and a judge on the Massachusetts Supreme Court, accepted the next appointment. John Thatcher's connection strongly influenced the rest of the list. His wife, Anna, was Abigail Adams' first cousin and Abigail's favorite brother-in-law, Richard Cranch, and Cotton Tufts, her family doctor and uncle, filled the next two positions. John Thaxter Jr. and Benjamin Lincoln Jr., both Harvard-educated lawyers, completed the list. Even if ordinary Hingham citizens lacked enthusiasm for the support of higher education, there clearly existed an elite group of Harvard graduates committed to the support of private schooling, both for the benefit of their own children and for the quality of future generations, a situation not unlike today. Keeping in mind the model of the Penn Charter School, the trustees proposed a program of study on several different levels, all limited to Hingham residents. For boys, there was a pre-college classical track, a comprehensive general education curriculum, and vocational training in navigation and surveying. Girls, of course, did not have the option of a college education, but could study at Derby from ages 9 to 17. The curriculum offered only English, French, arithmetic, and needlework, a limited selection, but except for sewing, revolutionary for its time. That a movement was growing for more formal schooling for girls, as is, is apparent from this image, a rare student list from an 1802 coeducational Hingham Town School. Note that unlike Derby, it only goes to age 12 for girls and seven for boys essentially a primary school. Total, total enrollment at Derby was set at 40 boys and 30 girls. Students could enroll or leave at any time of the year since the school for the first 40 years of its existence kept no records of student activities or who enrolled. We know very little about daily life at the school or the background of the student body. In addition, what we consider to be the normal organizational school structure did not exist. No terms or semesters, no class groupings, and no graduations, just clusters of students enrolled in various programs of study. Madame Derby had specified that the school could not open until after her death, which by 1789 she felt fast approaching. In June of that year, she arranged for a final version of her will leaving the bulk of her state to the, to the school. A year later, she died. All in all, the total of her legacy to Derby amounted to 7,000 pounds, a huge sum for the times. Compare that with John Harvard's um, legacy of 800 pounds. And in April of the following year, class, classes at Derby began. That they are still going strong today is a tribute to subsequent leaders and supporters of the school but just as importantly, it celebrates Sarah Derby's vision and the unlikely story of her contribution to co-education, not, not only in Hingham, but throughout the region. Fortunately, we will have the opportunity to learn more about this exceptional woman, woman on March 28th, when the Historical Society will present History at Play, Sarah Derby, an immersive, immersive living history experience. We hope you'll join us. So what are the lessons for today, if any? Certainly the inhabitants of Massachusetts face daunting challenges, 
in the two centuries we've examined, not only the ones from the 1600s that I've described, but also from various conflicts with French indigenous peoples of the area in the 18th century, not to mention the turmoil associated with the revolution and the establishment of a new national government. In spite of our anxieties about our current situation, I think one can reasonably argue that colonial Americans faced greater difficulties. They had several, they had several advantages though. One was their faith that they lived in an ordered universe ruled by a wise God, even if he seemed unpredictable and unscrutable. Inscrutable, especially in the 17th century, the Purans believed they had a deal, a covenant with him for his support as long as they behaved appropriately. By the 18th century, under the influence of Newton, Locke, and other Enlightenment thinkers, they had come to believe that with God-given reason, they could understand the laws of nature and the behavior of humans. Of course, not all New Englanders were Puritans, but there was enough unity of faith to instill in the population a sense of common purpose and hope for the future. That made the goal of education obvious, as, as we have seen with the New England Primer and the role of the church in education, the values to be passed on to the next generation could not have been clearer. The nature of the economy also helped. It too was much simpler than today. Wealth was based on land of which there was an abundance if one ignores the rights of, indigenous, of the indigenous peoples. And since most of the population engaged in farming for their livelihood, the availability of land, even if it meant moving to the frontier, provided economic opportunity for those left behind by the hierarchical structure in the older communities. Furthermore, for a farming population, occupational skills could be readily taught at home. In the lives we've examined, we have a glimpse of how these advantages played out in the experience of community leaders. The first Massachusetts settlers under the guidance of John Winthrop, John Cotton, and the clergy in general, established local grammar schools and, and a college, and a college within the first decade of their arrival. Homeschooling, church attendance, and a network of primitive dame and common schools taught the majority of the population the rudimentary reading, writing, and ciphering skills necessary for adult life. In the 18th century, we've seen that men like Benjamin Lincoln, with only a common school ed education, could rise to prominence and Sarah Langley, the tavern keeper's daughter, could found a revolutionary academy having had no formal schooling at all. Even though the distribution of wealth throughout the communities of Eastern Massachusetts was probably as unequal throughout the period we have examined as it is today, an educated elite, men like John Thaxter and the other trustees of Derby, committed their resources and time to promoting the importance of education for students at all levels. Women too played an important role. Deprived of the opportunities available to women today, their talent was focused on what could be done domestically. Their contribution, although uncelebrated, was crucial, not only in feeding and clothing their families, but also in teaching their children to read and running dame schools. Furthermore, the exceptional examples of Abigail Adams and Sarah Derby established role models for future women to follow. Today, we seem to have lost the cultural unity that defined the coeducational system, the educational system of colonial New England and, re and, and religious conformity is problematic as it, was already, as it was already by the time the constitution was written. The impact of technology is more difficult to assess on the one hand, computers and the internet have created promising possibilities for education, particularly in remote learning. On the other hand, social media's seemingly unrestrained spreading of misinformation and lies deeply divides us. Nonetheless, local leadership still makes a difference, especially in education. Whether we can regain a sense of common purpose remains to be seen. Um,
Thank you very much. I, I'll now take some questions if you have any. Thank you so much, Andy. And we do have questions coming in. Thank you all for your attention. As they say on the Rachel Maddow show, there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, there's so many, just working with Andy, there's so much that I learned about how things correlate or you know uh, influence each other, things happening in England at the same time as the colonies were growing here, uh, the influence of religion and uh, the economy. It's, it's really a fascinating look at education and uh, we really appreciate what you've brought to our attention, Andy. So let's start with some of these questions. So first question, how was school paid for in the first colonies? Who decided the curriculum? And were all kids, regardless of status, required to go to school? So those really are three questions. Why don't we start with how was school paid for? I think you touched on some of this in your remarks, Andy. Well, basically, for those who could afford to pay for it, they, they paid. And for those who couldn't afford to, the, the tax money um, paid. Uh, the, the towns were committed to making sure that everybody got an education. And um, so I, I don't know whether, well, there were laws actually that um, the laws we cited that um, required families to make sure that their children were educated. What was and then the who, who decided the curriculum was the second question there. Well, the curriculum sort of fell into place naturally because it reflected the values of the, the society. The purpose of the education, as I mentioned, was to promote piety and uh, the definition of piety was pretty clearly defined by the requirements for church membership and the fact that the whole Massachusetts Bay Colony was a religious experiment. And I think you covered were all kids, regardless of status, required to go to school. It sounds like the requirement was on the town and on the parents to make sure the children got an education. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Um, so Martha Bewick uh, asks, Regarding the regulations of 1647, the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony regulations requiring a grammar school to provide the, fit, the fittest an education for Harvard, was it assumed that the Harvard students would become clergy or was there also a general education? Well, originally, as you saw from the excerpt from the First Fruits, uh, the whole purpose of Harvard was to make sure that they had an educated ministry. But as uh, um, I mentioned, by the time we get to the 18th century, the, you know, some of the religious fervor had declined and the influence of the enlightenment had um, created the opportunities for a broader range of subjects. So by the 18th century, um, Harvard was teaching a lot of other things, um, science uh, in particular. And it sounds like people like John Adams started out uh, based on his father's desire, studying as if he was going to be a minister, and then he changed his mind during the course of his education, much as kids do today when they start as freshmen thinking one thing and then evolve over time. So that was apparently allowable within Harvard to rethink whether you'd be a minister. Oh yeah, um, well, Adams actually was like many kids today. He had no, I think, no intention of becoming a minister. He didn't like that. He wasn't really attracted to that. From an early age, I think he was thinking of becoming a lawyer. Uh, but Howard didn't, universities at this stage didn't have law schools. Uh, you, you studied law with uh, another lawyer, you sort of, were an apprentice in the lawyer's office and you read uh, various tomes on, on English law uh, on your own. So uh, here's a, a good question and I don't know if you've been able to uncover uh, information that answers this question. Uh, Ellen Miller asks, the inclusion of people of color, indigenous and black was uneven over history how, if at all, were they included in educational opportunities at this time? Well, part of the, um, part of the uh, impetus for colonization was to spread Christianity. 
And so there was an early, from right from the beginning, there was an effort to Christianize um, the indigenous peoples. And um, Harvard had, a, in fact, made an effort. It had a separate sort of separate school within Harvard for indigenous peoples. Um, and they, they learned Latin and, and there was a society for the propagation of the gospel that sent missionaries. Um, and the beginning of the uh, King Philip's War it came about, there were, there were Christianized um, indigenous people who were living in, in uh, specific towns. I think Needham, in fact, was one of them. Um, and three of these uh, people were uh, killed by um, Native Americans who were not um, interested in Christianity. And that was part of the, from the colonists' point of view, which sparked um, their hostility toward uh, uh, Medicom. So there were efforts, but they were, I mean, th th that went on throughout America in the late 19th century. There were boarding schools where they took um, indigenous peoples from their tribes in the Western states and took them to boarding schools in the East. And of course they were miserable and it didn't work. Um, so uh, we've discovered that trying to, trying to force your culture on another culture doesn't work very well. Uh, another question. I may have missed it, but whose idea was it to make Derby co-educational and how was it received in the community? Well, I don't really know the answer to that. I've just assumed, I guess, since Madam Derby was to put, had no formal education that I know of, that she would have been um, eager to do that. And as, as we did mention that the school, Penn Charter School in, in Philadelphia had set an example. And all along, um, there was a sense that women should be educated, you know, females should be educated to a certain level. Um, the Dame schools did that. And as I noted, um, all women in New England were literate. So somebody had to teach them that. So it wasn't as though no co-education had ever occurred until um, the end of the 18th century. Uh, another question about uh, Sarah Derby. My understanding is that Madame Derby stipulated that if Derby didn't succeed as an academy by a certain date, her estate gift would be transferred to Harvard, yes. thus providing an additional incentive to get it right. Yes, that's true. Because she, I guess, realized that these these exper experiments sometimes fail. A follow up to an answer you've already given, but I don't know if you have this detail. Can you describe the Native American school at Harvard, how long it was there and what was the cause of its demise? I don't know how many students were there. There was a, 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 a columnist named John Elliott who actually translated the Bible into um, Native American languages uh, and the school, well, as you can see, Harvard, the number of, of, uh, of uh, English, uh, of English colonists at Harvard, the classes were small, you know, only a dozen or so. So the number of uh, Native Americans in this Indian school was, I'm sure, very small. And it didn't last very long because, um, of the obvious problems of trying to uh, impose a completely different culture. <laughs> it's hard to imagine them getting excited about reading Cicero. So here's an interesting question. I noticed that in the picture of the Dame School, good eyes, a, a boy at the side has a dunce cap on and that later you read the admonition given to students, be not a dunce. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what made one deserving of the dunce cap and how students were graded and judged as to their academic success? Great question. Well, you mean all of us in our elementary school experience can probably uh, 
think of some student who was at the bottom of the class and quite obviously so because in whatever group um, activity there was, the, the person had trouble um, keeping up with other people. And I think since uh, so much of the education in the colonial period involved reciting things that they'd memorized, it would be pretty obvious um, which kids were having trouble. And rather than having special education and making efforts to compensate for different learning styles, um, they resorted to humiliation and, and force. Uh, so uh, this is a question having to do with numbers. Would you repeat what the casualties of the King Philip's War versus the Civil War and the Revolutionary War were? The, the questioner says he thinks he heard you say that they were greater than the Civil War and the Revolutionary War, and that's surprising to him. So he wonders if you could go back well, through that. Well, I don't actually have the, the, the number of people. The, the, the figure that I cited was the number as a proportion of the civilian, the non-combatant population. Right, I, I'm just going back to your script and you say the non-combatant, non-combatant casualties on both sides measured as a percent of the total population exceeded the toll in both the American Revolution and the Civil War. And you'd earlier said that there were 12 towns destroyed in the space of a year yeah. Uh, so it's the non-combatant casualties that you were focused on there. Yeah, and, and one of the um, examples that was pretty telling that I didn't um, think we had time to put in was um, what happened to a, a Narragansett village, which was also a, a sort of a, a fortress. And this was, of course, down toward Rhode Island. The Narragansetts made the unfortunate choice of, of becoming an ally of the Wampanoags, and therefore they were subject to attack by the, by the colonists. And the colonists surrounded this village so that the people couldn't leave, and then set it on fire. And um, the account describes it, the terrible smell of people burning to death, which were women and, and, and children. Um, so it was, it was bad on both sides. And then Another sort of anecdote here is that um, the house that we live, live in on Lincoln Street uh, was originally built in Weymouth and brought to Hingham to become part of an estate of the Gardner's Cottage. But the point is that the house had a compartment behind the chimney that was apparently used to shelter from uh, attack that there was actually the possibility of people attacking your house and you had to hide from it. And I know in Exeter, there was a, a, a so-called garrison house and it had a tunnel. It was about a block or two from the river. It had a tunnel that led down to the river whereby you could escape from the house and get into a boat, I guess. So the, the point here is that this was a war that raged through a civilian community. And, this, and the fact that it was a higher proportion of the population than either the Revolution or the Civil War is, is pretty telling because the South, of course, suffered terrible civilian casualties. So the um, um, Sherman's march to the sea, sea from Atlanta was uh, pretty devastating. And, um, and in the Revolution, there was a lot of guerrilla wars, particularly in the South. Uh, it's a lot of civilian casualty as possible. Uh, so a few uh, more questions and uh, a couple of people point to the to a book that you might want to read and I'm glad they did because I remembered Geraldine Brooks wrote something that I'd read a while back and two people have identified it. Uh, so thank you to Paula Bagger and Jenny McDonald. The book is Caleb's Crossing by Geraldine Brooks and the the reason they bring it to our attention today is because it provides interesting perspective on the Indian studying at Harvard and a, a wonderfully written book. So Caleb's Crossing, C-A-L-E-B, Caleb's Crossing, great book. Thank you, Paula and Jenny for bringing that oh, to our attention. Yeah, I have to say, um, I, can, I can say this now that you've heard the lecture that 
I'm not an expert on colonial um, education or even colonial history. When I was in graduate school, my field of concentration was late 19th century history, American history. So um, I've, this has been a, a learning, steep learning curve for me. And we're all benefiting from it, Andy. So thank you for that. So um, let me just get to a couple more questions. Oh, a good one. Was it common for kids to have diaries at this time? I don't know if we know how common it was. Um, I, I'm hesitating because the article um, that introduces the Quin, uh, Quincy Thaxter's diary does cite, well, it cites Anna Winslow's diary. So the, the word diaries, but I think most of them tended to talk about uh, what they did that day and what the weather was. And um, and you can see from Quincy's diary uh, that he didn't talk much about uh, his relation to the universe or his uh, mental state or how he, he didn't do with any problems of adolescence. And I wonder if it was encouraged in his case and perhaps others just for practicing penmanship. I, I think probably that's true. Um, in most of the, uh, there was, there was a diary of, that I think William Byrd kept. Uh, it was a plantation, big plantation owner in Virginia, who kept a detailed diary. But again, it was it was just daily details, including when he had intercourse with his wife. He included that fact in there too. So, but nothing. Um, they, they, in many cases, they weren't too useful. Okay, uh, another book has been recommended, and I, I agree, Mayflower, written by Nathaniel Philbrick, great account of King Philip's War. Uh, so uh, you've got a couple of things you can uh, avail yourselves of to, to uh, enrich your understanding of this time period. Uh, so here's a question uh, for you, Andy. Did Dartmouth in the early 18th century have any more success in educating Native Americans than Harvard did? I don't know. I don't know very much about Dartmouth's um, history. Um, they obviously, it, it was founded, I think, in its charter. It was, that was part of the, the mission. So unlike Harvard's um, incorporating act, which said the point was to have educated clergy, I think Dartmouth um, was actually dedicated to the idea of educating Native Americans, um, and they have a they have a clause, I think, in the admissions that if you're if you are a Native American, you have some some preference in admission. But I'm not sure about that. Uh, so this is going to be our final question, and it really uh, goes back to a little bit of what you suggested in your closing remarks, Andy. The question is relating to the separation between church and state. What are your thoughts on the current events in the classroom? Politics are everywhere, and there are so many amazing lessons all around us. Staying objective and neutral politically is not impossible, but the tenor of the times has made some parents nervous about this, and conversations can be fraught, but seemingly vital. So we could probably have a whole discussion group on this topic, but your thoughts, Andy? Well, first of all, it's um, it's important to, to note that in the Constitution, it says something of the effect that the um, government will show, make no laws establishing uh, religion. It's clear that religion is supposed to is not supposed to be pushed any one particular religion pushed by uh, the government. On the other hand, the United States has traditionally been a, a Protestant country. And um, that is playing out today. Uh, Josh Hawley, there's a lot of talk about how his um, opposition to the certification of the election was a cynical move to promote his political um, chances. But Josh Hawley is a very religious guy, and he is um, obviously, at least one article I read, he seems to be very much opposed uh, to what modern society has done, which is um, 
created so many different ways of looking at relation that you don't have the unity of um, that occurred in colonial New England. And you couldn't achieve that. If that was one of the key things that helped them pass on the values of the society, the next generation, we can't do that today because there isn't that um, uniformity of, of, of belief. And actually is an interesting example. In the charter, um, I should have probably had a copy of it in front of me because I can't remember the exact wording, but the charter says that, or the deed of gift from the Phillips family says that the instructors should pay close attention to the, to the minds of the uh, students, but also to the morals uh, because um, goodness without, let's see, Goodness, knowledge without goodness without knowledge is is weak and feeble. But knowledge, let's see. Well, the idea is that if you have goodness, it, it has to have knowledge. It's going to be weak. If you have knowledge without goodness, it's dangerous. So you're supposed to teach both. And and we do okay on the knowledge part. We work with kids pretty hard. But I don't think we've ever figured out, well, how to teach goodness. Um, I was a student at Exeter, graduated in 1957, and they had um, required church. Um, it was a sort of non-denominational church. And I grew up in the Episcopal church, and I, yeah, I did the whole bit. I went to Sunday school, I sang in the choir. I was a, um, an acolyte. Um, and then I went to Exeter. And this non-denominational service was so um, bland and, and, and it was fact that it was required, in fact, turned me off. And then of course I went on to college and I learned about um, what, what the Catholic church had done and the inquisition and so forth. And so my education actually led me away, away from religion and how schools can teach morality is um, problematic. And I think that's what we're struggling with partly now. Well, on that note, Andy, uh, obviously we live in fraught times uh, as did our colonial ancestry, uh, but uh, you've given us so much to think about and uh, enlightened us on information that we either never knew of or had long ago forgotten. So. Thank you so very much, Andy. Um, I want to welcome all of the uh, subscribers and ticket holders for today who would like to join us in the follow-up Zoom because we can continue some of these conversations among ourselves as an audience. Uh, and Andy may join us if you'd like to. Uh, don't wanna pepper you with too many more questions, Andy, but we did go through all of the questions that were submitted. Thank you so much for the thoughtful questions for the book recommendations. Having an engaged audience really makes these programs so successful. So thank you very much for that. And Deidre, I see you've rejoined us. Would you like to say anything? Okay, all right, with that, thank you, Andy. What a wonderful job. I should mention that in the Q&A, we saw a couple of hozas for you. How wonderful your presentation was. And uh, just, you've astonished me in, in what you've brought into the topic of education. It's, it's yeah, such a rich topic. You were a big part of this. Uh, well, I learned a lot. You've been a good teacher. So yeah, thank the, you so the, much. I'm, on that, I'm, I, I'm impressed with the right. audience because uh, listening to anybody for an hour is, uh, the, the Puritans could do it. The <laughs> sermons went on. We have a dedicated audience. I was watching the numbers and the audience yeah. hung in there. So thank you all. Hope you yes. enjoyed it. Uh, the light is fading from the sky, so you've given up a lovely afternoon for this, so uh, much appreciated. And Andy, thank you. We're going to end the program now and let you get on with your afternoons, but if you'd like to join us for the Zoom, please do. I plan to. Get yourself a beverage if you'd like to join us and look for that Zoom invitation that came to your email during the program. So where, um, how do I join this? 
So Andy, I, I've sent you the uh, e uh, the email to Andy. I did see some names that I didn't recognize. So if you are on or a, um, a, a teacher joining us, um, and you just want to put your if you have not received an email from me, please put your uh, email in the Q and A, and I will include you in our um, the Zoom link for our post lecture discussion. Okay, and I'm going to keep that Q and A open for another minute, and. Uh, Oh, Chris, by the way, Chris Herdig found the quote for yes, you. I love it. Two goodness, people did. Goodness without knowledge is weak and feeble, yet knowledge without goodness is dangerous. Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, Chris <laughs> a couple of people submitted that. He's actually the, a fourth grade teacher and he's, he's um, having a unit on colonial history. So um, I love it. she's helpful for him. Great. Okay, we're going to let you go now. Andy, thank you. Thank you so much. And see thank some you, of Andy. you on the Zoom to follow.